we'll start with, is a clothes washer overflow pan required? And I'll just start with Ruben. Do you need a pan under a washer? No, you do not. Next what? question. No, just kidding. Yeah. I, you should I, do I, it though. It, it's you it's should. a great idea. And when you've got a second story, it's like, how are you going to put that in? You're going to put a drain going all the way to the basement? No. Something we put in our reports is something you may want to do is put in these little sensors. They cost about 150, 200 bucks. You put them on the floor and they connect to the fill to the valves. So that if you do have a leak, they will shut those valves off automatically. That's a great alternative to trying to put in an overflow pan. It's not as effective, but I think it's a great backup. And we put that in our reports. Anytime we got a washing machine over finished areas without an emergency drain pan. Yeah, and you can also, you know, it's not a, a sewer drain. So you could just poke a pipe out the side of the house or something. I don't care. You know, well, yeah, in California, you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Washers are really heavy. Uh, and most of the time I see those pans just get destroyed with the guy trying to hump the washer over it and into it. Yeah, the crash oh, over yeah. it. It's not, not going to do much. <laughs> or you see a pan that doesn't have a drain connected to it. So the answer well, all the is time. <laughs> no, but it's a good idea. Does the black CSST need to be bonded? No. Well, it needs to be bonded as conventional hard pipe does, but not with the intensity that you would with yellow. How's that? That's a good answer. I mean, the yeah, answer it, is the gas pipe needs to be bonded. Yeah, all gas yes. pipe needs to be bonded. There's nothing special you need to do for CSS, black CSST. Right. Yep, Ruben's correct. Absolutely. Now, if it's yellow, much different story. Let it mellow. So uh, explain the difference between the two. In, in Maryland, we have a very specific CSST requirement that we're required to tell people. In Virginia, we have that same requirement. I'm curious, uh, in Minnesota, are they regulating CSST and the home inspectors? Does Minnesota even have a license? No, we don't. Huh. Minnesota does not recognize home inspectors. <laughs> well, California yeah. doesn't have licensing, but we have that requirement for yellow CSST we're required to recommend or tell people that only an electrician can identify if it's properly bonded. Only an electrician can tell you whether it's really bonded. Hmm. Yep. I, I always tell my clients that, you know, the, the problem, the reason it's not bonded is the plumber installs the pipe but the electrician installs the bonding wire and nobody told the electrician to come back and bond it. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> What does a water softener do? What softens water? <laughs> yeah, well, it, yeah. <laughs> thank you. That's, That's a good one, Larry. <laughs> You're here. It, uh, it removes, does anybody understand the chemistry? Yeah, what of that? Well, it, it's it's a reaction with the the briny, the salt water, and the rosin bed in the bottom of the or in the tank of the of the uh, water softener. And basically, what it does is the hardness minerals cling to the to the material that's in the softer, and when it when it uh, regenerates, it dumps all that the uh, hardness, or not all of it, but most of it down the the uh, reject pipe, which goes to you know wherever the plumber put it. So it it removes a lot of the the minerals, so that the water doesn't leave scaling and and uh, other debris um, in your pots and pans and toilets and so on. So when you when you pull that cover off that Rubbermaid trash can, uh, what should you see inside there, and what should its condition look like? Well, there should be salt pellets. It doesn't have to be full because basically it only fills up with maybe a foot of water. And what it's doing is it's getting the the salt molecules, which will be used by the softer tank to get rid of the hardness. So when you open it up, there should be some salt in there, and there should be some water. Now. I've seen home inspectors where they say that, oh, it needs to be full of salt. And that's not true. As long as you've got, you know, a bag or two in the bottom, it'll work. Now, you can certainly fill it and then not have to screw around with it for six months. You know, it just depends. Um, but there should be a little bit of briny water in there and uh, some salt pellets. That's pretty much it. Should it. Should it be clean or can it be all like gross and nasty? Well, ew. Uh <laughs> right. I, I have a water softener, and if I opened up that, that trash pail and it was, was gross and nasty, I would want something done about that. 
So it, it should not be, you know, it shouldn't be discolored or anything. It should be just plain water. It'll be a bit salty and some salt. Um, that's about it. That's all that should be in there. So uh, I remember watching something and it was uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. If you guys know Bill Nye, uh, mm -hmm. he was talking about soft water and he says that uh, softening the water makes water wetter. And basically it's, it's, it, it, I know it's very, you know, he's probably talking it's to slippery or kids, really. but yeah, right. It's, it's slippery, right? That's what a lot of people say, especially the way they react with like taking a shower, the way it feels on your skin, but it softens the structure so that water can get in deeper with your skin into the pores, uh, into your, uh, into the fabrics in your, in your laundry. Um, it basically does what detergents do. And, um, especially when you have well water, which is typically where you see the, the neutralizer and the softener. Um, it's really important because it allows you to cut back on your detergents, um, which also helps the septic system down the line where you have less uh, introduced into the whole biology. So um, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's, so it's, what, it's important. So it helps your plumbing too. The, the image that's here is sort of a standard setup that we'll see the two tanks and the salts tank. What are some of the other treatment systems that are out there? Oh, gosh, you can buy a treatment system for just about anything um, for acidic water, um, for uh, dirt and, and sediment. You know, it just depends upon the, the issue. Iron, um, you know, it's some of the systems use marble chips to, to change chemistry of the water. Just you name it, you can get it. You now, most okay. people will have, you know, so actually you can, what, what is pretty popular now is uh, systems to remove chloramine or at least reduce chloramine, which is a sanitizer that's being used in some city water. Um, but it's found to be not good for neoprene and EPDMs, which are rubbers that are pretty much in everything that we use <laughs> in plumbing. So um, that's a popular one. But just a plain water softener, you know, a lot of people don't want to have that crusty uh, white stuff around their faucet aerators and the tub spout and the shower heads um, in their pans, you know, the teapot, that kind of stuff. But a water softener, just a plain salt type water softener is good for that, except some jurisdictions now are not allowing salt type water softeners and you have to go to a non-salt type. I know, I know, Ruben, it's crazy oh. and I don't know how they're doing it. I've, I've looked into a couple of them, and I'm just like, it seems kind of hocusy pocusy to me, but because you pretty much have to have the brine to remove the minerals. It's got to have something, molecules to attach to, you know, is the chemistry behind it. So anyway, I, personally, you know, we have an old-fashioned salt water soft, and it works great. <laughs> Same here. I'm curious what, uh, what you guys tell your clients when when they ask about the water, and I'm talking like city water, uh, and you know they oh I want a whole house filter, and they'll have a spun web cartridge, you know, <laughs> right on the main line, nice clear Canister. view of it. Yeah, um, yeah, go for it. You know, <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, I I can say as as far as what we tell our clients during home inspections, when when you're on a well. It's like you you need some type of whole house filter. If you're on city water, you probably don't. And when it comes to water softeners, something we do with every one of our home inspections, we the standards do not require this. So right. I'm not telling anybody you have to do this, but we buy those test strips and we buy them by the thousands. And on every one of our inspections, we do a water hardness test strip because we've got some municipalities out where I live you don't have a water softener, your faucet is going to be all nastified within about a month. I mean, you have to have a water softener. So people kind of expect us to let them know if you don't have it. So we do a test strip at one of the faucets that should have softened water. We take a picture of what the little color indicates along with the chart. And we say, here's about where the water softness level is. If this is not to your liking, you may want to follow up with a water treatment specialist. We don't say it's functioning properly. We don't go into any kind of details like that. Say, hey, you have to have one. We just give them some information and it's worked out really well. People appreciate that. Yeah, that, you know, that's that's a good point. I mean, our, my service level is not at that caliber yet, but no. um, basically, <laughs> basically what, 
what I do is tell people that there's a water softener, but we don't test performance. And they might want to inquire with the seller or the company that services it. Plus, another good thing you want to know is, is it owned or rented? We see a lot of them that are rented. So the homeowner that's existing doesn't own that. So the buyer is going to want to find out, you know, what does that cost? Is there, a, is there an agreement that's transferable? And so on. You know, kind of like solar panels. You know, we don't know if they're owned or if they're leased, and we recommend clients inquire, find out. Yeah, well, a, a, a rented system actually is a, is a good sign in many ways that it's probably being maintained. That often you find systems that are owned and they're empty or bypassed. Right. Um, but I, you know, in our area, our city water is is uh, acidic. It's not as acidic as our well water, but. Um, if you're going to use a neutralizer um, to, which is basically calcite or some combination, it makes the water harder because of the calcite. And so if you have a neutralizer, you should have a softener, probably a filter That's, first <laughs> and yeah. then a neutralizer. But the, the neutralizer actually does a good job of filtering the water. Going what about through a all UV the light? You want to add a UV light? I, I am not a big believer in the UV light systems. I've seen uh facilities that you're not a big believer in the the physics of uv light or... uh it, well so yeah i know wells quite well yes. pardon the pun and You've got like three of them uh, yes and so where i've seen and even a facility it was an outdoor adventure camp that had three wells and they could not solve this water contamination issue Every year, the state requires this, a test because it's a camp. And uh, instead of sterilizing their well, they would just put the UV light in there, and it did not work. It wasn't strong enough. You sterilize a well, you know, 24 hours later, you basically you're good to go as long as unless you have a major issue. But it was always mm -hmm. easily solved if you do it right. Um, so I don't believe in the UV lights, but they probably work. So speaking of public and private water, in your reports, uh, do you identify public or private water and sewer? Do you specify what it's on? Why or why not? Um, it's not part of the standard, I don't think. Uh, I always do. I just assumed I it was too. part of the standard, but, um, but I do. Hollis, I do as well. And so do I. Hollis, Hollis had an interesting story, and I don't know if he's available to talk now or not, about why he doesn't do this. I remember telling that story, but I don't remember what I said. You just, so yeah. Hollis, all right, I'll tell you the story. Hollis was doing a house that was in a development. Uh, and originally it was a farm story. house. I remember now. This, oh, is my, okay. this is my story. You're this getting is, it wrong already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. So I, um, um, the, the, built, the land developer had bought the farm. There was one house on the property when they bought it. They used the farmhouse as the um, construction office during construction when they put in the roads and sewers and everything uh subdivided it put in the houses sold all the houses after the last house was sold they remodeled the farmhouse and hooked it to the public water and left it connected to the septic now how was i supposed to pick that up now, don't talk about it <laughs> everybody when i told that story everybody told me that i should have known or at least i should have disclaimed that I didn't know, I hadn't confirmed that it's on that, that that it's on public sewer. Well, that suggests that we should always disclaim because we never know that it's on public sewer. You can, you, not, can confirm, you can be sure you can be certain that it's on septic, but how do you confirm that it's on public? So you get charged for it a lot of times on your utility bill. Yeah, but home inspectors aren't required to determine if sewage disposal is public or private. And I think that's pretty close to the exact wording in the in the standards of practice. So, you know, I mean, well is usually kind of easy, although, you know, where I live, you know, we're on a on well, but it's our own private community system for like 160 homes. And we have 14 wells. But so that's a little bit unique. But you know, septic disposal or sewage disposal. It's not really something that you know we can be sure about. I, I've got a lot of stories I can tell you about that, about claims against home inspectors. You know, I we did a, a a claim one time where there was a septic tank in the front yard, but the pipe that exited it connected to the city sewer, so they had both. 
<laughs> so, I mean, you want to see some crazy stuff. So I would disclaim septic altogether or sewage disposal because we're I not required to do it. You know, I know a lot of us maybe feel that we should tell people, but they should inquire with the seller or the county health department or wherever the records are kept. So, or maybe you say something like, well, the, you know, per the, the MLS information, it says septic. However, you should verify this information as, you know, whether it's accurate or not. That's what I, I would wonder, say. I, I wonder if that house you mentioned got a discount on their their water because they were pre-treating the wastewater, right? They were sort of reducing yeah. the load. <laughs> yeah. Well, I see that with homes that have city water or uh, it used to be a well system. Uh, I see this like in Poolsville uh, where it's been converted to a city system and some people still kept their wells active. They use it for irrigation for mm -hmm. you know their, their crops or whatever, and you're, you're not supposed to. It, that is definitely illegal, um, but it happens. So yeah, but you can in some states you can keep that well for irrigation purposes as long as there's no cross connection to the house system. Um, and then yep. a lot of times, also, what happens is the home is connected to city sewer. However, they didn't properly abandon the septic tank that's still in the backyard. And when they bring in the backhoe to dig for the pool, that's when they're going to find it. So you know, just don't. I, I wouldn't talk about. It. I would say septic, you know, disposal is excluded. <laughs> That's my advice. What is the minimum drain slope? Quarter inch, four foot. What is the maximum drain slope? Three, three inches. inches. Hmm. Are we sure about that? We're hoping. <laughs> <laughs> What's the concern if it's sloped too much? It leaves the poops behind. The water goes away too fast. Well, with today's modern um, uh, toilets and so on, you know, they're a gallon and a half flush or so. Um, you know, usually when you use the toilet, the the uh, the solid doesn't go away completely. It's waiting for the next shower or something to come along to take a ride down to the to the septic disposal. So, um, you know, minimum slope is a quarter inch for most most plumbing drains. Sometimes it's an eighth. Um, I don't think in the plumbing code there's a maximum. So as far as I know, there's never yeah. been a maximum slope. For, for a drain. Although once we get into trap arms, it that's totally different. changes. Right, the, that's different Yeah, for trap yeah. arm, as you know, Ruben, because the, the trap arm, the weir has to see the vent opening, basically. Yeah, I've got a nice diagram if I can share my screen at some point, but I think we're getting ahead. I think that was another question coming up later. It is. Okay. We'll yeah. So there. there's no, you know, ideally a quarter inch per foot or so up to a half, but it's not always available. You know, it just depends upon room and so on. Um, um, typically with plastic pipes, it's not that big of a deal because they're pretty slippery inside. So, you know, it's the cast iron where the, where the solids will hang up and the water bypasses and, and it builds up. But typically, you know, it's not going to, a gallon and a half flush is not going to take it away anyway. It's waiting for the next shower or somebody to, you know, one of the kids to hang out in the shower for half an hour. That gets rid of everything. So yeah, next, don't tell my kids that's a good thing. Right. Our next question is, uh, are expansion tanks required on all new water heaters? No. The manufacturer says you should put one on. The manufacturer well, on well, says it. Already the manufacturer right. says you need an expansion tank, not only the manufacturer, but the plumbing code is going to say the same thing. They're in agreement that if you don't have a way of that heated expanding water to expand somewhere, you need to do something about it. That's what it comes down to in layman's yeah. terms. Yeah. And if, if you're on a municipal system, the water will naturally expand back into the city system. It, it'll go back. It's fine. If you're on a well, you surely have a, a big tank. expansion tank right? yeah, yeah. and expansion. it'll expand into there we're good the, the only time you run into a problem is when you have a check valve on the city city supply coming in basically turning your system into a closed system and that's the way the manufacturer's instructions are going to read saying if you've got a closed system then you need to provide for expansion real mm -hmm. simple and that's what the code says too yeah and it's basically it says you'll you'll provide a thermal commons, a com thermal expansion control. It doesn't say an expansion tank. It does yeah. for a boiler, but that's not a water heater. 
So, you know, and also it's kind of hard for, as a home inspector to tell if you've got a pressure reducing valve, whether it's a bypass type or not. And bypass means it'll allow uh, pressure flow back into the system. So, and you know, most I of can, the time you'll, yeah, you, no, you go ahead, Ruth. Well, I, I can just share with you how I figure out the difference. If I'm curious, if I see one of those, because I don't have a lot of them in my area, right? I see them, I like to turn on a ton of hot water. I'll run hot water at all the fixtures all oh, at the get same that time. Thing cranking. Yeah, and I'll, yeah I'll, I'll take all the hot water out of that tank. It'll fill up with cold water and then I'll shut all the wall, all the water off. And then I'll go outside and I'll do my thing for a half hour or whatever. And in a very short period of time, it will build up a tremendous amount of pressure if it's a closed system and that pressure relief valve will start leaking. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, most of, I know here in, um, in California, just about everyone we see is a non-bypass. So there needs to be some sort of thermal expansion control and that could be an expansion tank. It could be, um, a, uh, you know, a Watts uh, toilet fill valve, the Watts Governor 80 that spits a little bit of water out. It could be a, a relief valve somewhere that's set at 75 PSI. There's many different ways to do it. Expansion tank just happens to be the most common, but there are other ways to compensate for expansion. Well, I'm experiencing a couple of dynamics here. One is that home inspectors are reporting them as, a, as the absence of the uh, expansion tank as a defect when it's not correct and the other is that the plumbers are getting tired of people telling them that it's improperly installed so they're putting them in anyway whether it's required or not uh, yeah like <clears throat> probably and the one in your picture is not properly supported by <laughs> are you sure well it's really small and it's early for me my eyes aren't <laughs> no you're right and that's why it's there so you can't just hang it off the pipe like that? Well, you can, but it's not correct. You can see it already <laughs> looks like it's bending a little bit. It is. Yeah. What, what if it's oriented vertically and hanging down? Can it hang from the pipe like that? As long as the pipe is supported. <laughs> yeah, my, my litmus test, I'm not going to any code book on that. It's like if I can flop it around, I say it's not properly supported. Yeah. I, that's as far as I go. Well, yeah, now the supply house... The supply house now has a lots of cool little brackets and different things to I like the to side mount on the yeah. strap. It. I like it when it's actually vertical oh. and, and right up and it's just the tank is supporting it and then your your supply is going out on the side. Do you knock on them to see if they're waterlogged? Uh yeah. Yeah, knock at the bottom and then knock at the top. You should get two different, very different sounds. True. Yeah, right. If I could reach it, yeah. Yeah, we, we always do that on pressure tanks, expansion tanks. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a very clear difference in sound. Yeah. The dull thud, like my head, means it's full of water. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say about saddle valves? What's wrong with them? <clears throat> They're prone to leaks. Yeah, is that on water supply? Yeah. yeah, it's it's a it's for an ice maker or for a whole house humidifier is the two places we typically yeah. find them. Right. And we find them at a at least every other house we inspect. Right. We, yeah. They've got them. Everybody's got them. They're prone yep. to leaks. And not, yeah. not optimal for it. sure. No. <laughs> it's like a, it's a controlled leak. Do you basically. point them out? Like if you see a saddle valve, do you say, hey, you know, keep an eye on this? Or do you only do that when you see that it's leaked or we, we, so, we say these are prone to leakage, and in the future, you may want to have a plumber replace it, but we're not going to say, hey, these are illegal and you need to get a plumber come out. I mean, most of the time, it's going to be fine, and it's it's going to be cost prohibitive to hire a plumber to come out and redo all these connections. So Jerry Mannix um, tells the story. He's a, a owner. Of, some of you may be familiar with uh, Mannix Heating and Cooling. So he um, told all of his um, uh, employees that um, they are not to use saddle valves. You are not to use the saddle valve. So every time he'd set up, if they had a, a, a humidifier going in, that he would set out the proper valve with every humidifier uh, that got loaded on a truck to go do installations that day. And um, his employees were throwing them away and using the saddle valve that came with the humidifier. <laughs> 
So eventually, he had to, he had his he had his office his, his um, warehouse staff start opening the boxes, take the saddle valve out, throw it away, and put the proper valve in. Okay, because he the the, the, the failure rate was so high that it was costing him money. Um, I all I always tell people these things are um, uh, are prone to failure, and I recommend I recommend they have them replaced. Yeah, especially on well water. <laughs> When and where are L and Y waste pipe connectors disallowed and why? And the disallowed is a little confusing. Yeah. Right? Well, well, I, this, this all comes down to trap arms, I think, and proper venting. Uh, is, right. is there, is there a diagram you could share to show, show the difference between say a combo fitting and a sanitary T and if if not, I've got one at my fingertips. If I could share my screen, I think you can share your screen at any point. Okay, if you just push Sweet. that button. Yeah, right. thank you. Uh, let's see here. I'll put this one up. I don't have it maximized just so I can see it, but uh, basically, w back to the drain slope. So when you've got a trap arm, there's a maximum slope that you can have because. Like Mike was saying earlier, the weir of the trap, the top of that trap where the water sits needs to be able to go in a perfectly horizontal line and see air. It needs to see the vent. If it can't, you got the potential for this whole thing to fill up with water and it's not going to be vented properly. That's why we have maximum distances on trap arms. That's why we have maximum slopes on trap arms so that the weir of that trap can see the air. It can see the vent. And that's where it takes us to the, the question at hand. Why can't you use a combo fitting on there or a long or a Y fitting? A Y fitting would be essentially the same thing as this long sweep mm -hmm. fitting. Basically, you're not going to be able to see the vent. That, that's what it comes down to. A sanitary T will. And then, of course, if you turn mm -hmm. it on its side and, and the water is going down, it's going to slope the water in the correct direction. Combo fittings are good for that. And then... If you have a sanitary C, sanitary T laying on its back, it's not going to direct the water enough in the proper direction. Hey, Mike, what what did I miss? Well, also in that same book where this uh, this diagram came from, there's a table, and it all has to do with you know what's the change in direction? Is it horizontal to vertical? You know, vertical to horizontal. Whether you can use it technically, a um, a um, sanitary T is not permitted on its back. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind, but there is a table there that with different fittings in that code checkbook that tells you what you can use and what you can't. Now, you know, a, a, a sanitary T on its back, you know, if you're taking a, a waste pipe, a three inch pipe from the second floor bathroom and it's going straight vertical down to a, a sanitary T on its back, when everything hits the, the inside of that T, it explodes and stuff goes everywhere. So yeah. you need something more directional in that type of a vertical to horizontal transition. But in the transition under a sink, like you were showing, you know, you're going from horizontal to vertical um, where you need to be able to see the vent. So it just, it all really depends upon the situation. Our next question is what is that sulfur odor in bathrooms and kitchens? What can be done about it? The rotten egg smell coming out of the hot water. It's it's in the yeah. Just go to the manufacturer's website. Website. Basically, what you want to do is is uh, is superheat the water heater for fifteen or minutes or so and kill the bacteria, and then remember to turn it back down again. <laughs> so the the thing we're talking about here is there is an anaerobic bacteria that can grow in the water heater, oftentimes right. in water heaters that aren't being utilized. Uh, or set low and the water sits there long enough. Um, superheating it can do it. Sometimes it doesn't, though. Yeah, there's chemicals water. that can be treated. Uh, I just try the superheat first. Not as a home inspector, but I would hear. <laughs> I'm not going to so fix what, it. <laughs> so but if I smell anode? it, I'm going to tell them about it. What, what about the anode rod? Did you it could be an anode, anode rod. rod. Yeah, it could be. What they really need to do is get a plumber out to figure out what's going on. It could be both. It could be a anode rod. Need, the metal needs to be changed. Um, they may have to use a different type of, of uh, sacrificial anode. There's a couple different types. 
Uh, sometimes you have aggressive water that attacks you know, the, the magnesium and they have to change it to a different one. So it could be bacteria. But, you know, basically get a plumber. Compare and contrast water heaters, pros and cons. And I'll start with, I think this image is, is heat pump favored, but we can talk more about that. Um, we've got our typical tank with the draft hood. We've got high efficiency forced uh, tank ones, tankless, heat pumps, electric, gas, oil. Um, curious how people deal with their clients and maybe in your markets you have this too where um, the, the young people buying houses want to have all the cool bells and whistles. They want a Nest thermostat and the ring doorbell and they want a tankless water heater because that's what it's looks cool. It's a buzz, cool. yeah. Um, it's compact. Either Mike or uh, Ruben, uh, opinions on replacement with tankless or options sure. for heat pump, electric? I can, I can chat a little bit about it. Uh, and maybe Mike and I can just kind of go over each one together. Uh, Mike <laughs> will fill in everything I miss because he's good at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, the, for the heat pump type, it, it works off electricity. So if you've already got gas and you're going to switch over, you're going to need an electrician to install a 240 circuit for that. And they're noisy. My neighbor's got one. He's got it in the room next to his office and you can hear that thing running constantly. I find it to be extremely obnoxious. Not only that, but it removes heat from the room that it's in to transfer that heat to the water. So when you're in an environment like Minnesota, we've got cold basements. I don't want to remove heat from my basement room and transfer that to the water. I don't like the idea of making it cooler. However, it doesn't remove a ton. It might make the room a couple of degrees colder if you have the door shut. Uh, they are they are more efficient. I mean, they, they take heat out of the air. Uh, you're, not, you're not using a ton of electricity over a long period of time. I can't, and I can't read that graphic, but I, I know you are going to save energy and, and it's probably not going to pay for itself, but it's going to save you energy. So that, that, those are some of the pros and cons that I know about heat pumps. How about you, Mike? Yeah, well, you know, we, we see quite a few of them um, with the, you know, the war against fuel gas. And um, it, it's, it's something that, you know, they do run a long time. I know when I, when I see a house where I'm inspecting it, it's got a heat pump. Once that thing kicks on, it pretty much almost always runs the whole time I'm there because it takes a lot of time to get the, extract the heat from the air. Basically, it's a, it's an air conditioner running backward, which is a heat pump, and it's taking you know, heat from the air in the surrounding room and transferring that to the uh, water in the tank. And they do have backup electric elements, typically. Um, the one thing that a lot of people forget is they need a lot of air. And if you read the instructions for installing them, you need a room that's like 10 by 8 by, you know, 8 foot ceiling to install it in. And if you don't have a room that big, you've got to put in what's called a restricted um, air or restricted location kit and you've got to you know have these ducts go into the outside and so on it's it's pretty complicated if you look into the installation instructions and i've seen them all the time stuck in small rooms with not enough air that's the, like the biggest thing that i see and that's an installation issue otherwise you know they'll provide you with hot water they, they work it just um and suppose that they save some money so that's great most people at least here in California, we have probably half the houses I look at are on solar. So they're getting their electricity from the sun anyway. What is the recovery rate for something like that? And then they also have filters. Slow. <laughs> the filters on them need to be clean with some rate. Yes. Yes. And they're on the top and nobody knows it's there. <laughs> yep. And for, for tankless, uh, the you know the the obvious pro is that you're never going to run out of hot water that's that's the big pro uh as far as cost savings you're not going to save a ton of money it is minuscule minuscule and the as far as the cons go you will probably need to have a larger gas line installed to support that a uh, typical burner on a traditional water heater is going to be like 40,000 BTUs you go tankless you're looking at like 200,000 BTUs. I've seen several homes where they were insistent on getting a tankless water heater. They needed to upgrade the gas service. They needed to upgrade the meter 
on the outside of the house just to accommodate all of that. They need to run a new gas line over. You need to do new venting. You can't use the traditional vent that went up through the middle of the house. You got to power vent it out the side of the house. It's all these different things. So it ends up being way more expensive. And for what? So you don't run out of hot water. You got to plus the maintenance. Plus, yeah, they need to be uh, cleaned with, you know, some acid every three to five years. Well, maybe three to five in your area, my area, annually. They need to be flushed annually. Or That's you a lot of money. Manufacturer's warranties. And you got to hire a plumber to come out. They got to disconnect everything, flush this system <laughs> through it. It's crazy. So, I mean, you're going to spend way more money on it. I think traditional tank water heaters work just fine. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the tankless. Yeah, I got 50 also, gallons of hot water out in the garage waiting for me. <laughs> when you go to the manufacturer's sizing chart, too, you'll find you actually need two tankless to take care of all the fixtures you have in the house. And now you've essentially blown the idea completely out. It makes no sense at all. Yeah. I've I've worked on a couple of jobs as a consultant where people complaining about not enough hot water. And it was because of the tankless water heater was didn't allow enough gallons per minute flow. They needed, you know, two of them. We have a Um, comment here in the room. Yeah. One, one of the things too, to keep in mind, I mean, tankless water heaters are extremely popular in Europe but there, the plumbing system is designed for the tankless. You don't have hot water lines running throughout the house. You just have a cold water line, and then the tankless are at point of use. So right. you aren't trying to run the water from a centralized location throughout the rest of the house. So you're getting heat loss in transmission and all that. American plumbing systems are designed for a central distribution of hot water. Now you could get point of use hot uh, water heaters, uh, tankless heaters, but it just doesn't work as well with American systems. Well, and they're also going to be electric, and then you're going to start dropping efficiency there if you're trying to use electric tankless. Mm. You guys have any thoughts on uh, electric, gas, and oil? The last three they have listed there. Any? We don't say that much oil anymore. I don't have any feelings <laughs> yeah. one way or the other about them. Yeah, oil oil certainly is fast recovery. Um, you know, electric, they're they're quite efficient because 100% of the heat goes into the water. You're not losing any up a flue pipe. Uh, it's just the cost of electricity is higher than, than fuel gas. Uh, you know, good right. old our fuel next, gas or propane works fine. Our next question is, what temperature should water heater be set to? And I'm noticing that while this is an effective part of that, this is not actually the image that would go with that question. Um, what's the proper temperature on a water heater? 120. Yeah. One, well, one. remember, delivery temperature should not exceed 120. So Correct. at the water heater, you probably need to be a little bit higher. But then also, if you got a B day, maximum delivery temperature is 110 degrees. So you may have to have that valve that's in the picture installed for your. Uh, for your your uh, bidet, that looks like a temperature uh, a mixing valve. That is a mixing valve. Yeah. How do you test ceramic tile shower pans? Should you? Does anybody do a, a flood test on a shower pan? All I have the time? a very Sometimes. long history of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, after some conference I went to, I don't know, a decade or two ago, I learned about using doing a flood test on a tiled shower where you you block the drain and then you run about an inch or two of water in that tiled shower and you let it sit there for 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it is. You make sure that you don't have water spots on the ceiling below. And I I would find leaks and I thought this is the greatest thing ever. I, I don't know what I was missing before I started doing this until one day I'm training another home inspector and I forget that I'm filling the shower, we go out walking. And then the next thing I know the homeowners, there's somebody inside's like, is there supposed to be water coming out of my ceiling? I forgot to pull my stopper and I left the shower running. It overflowed like crazy. That was a big insurance claim. So Mm -hmm. after that, I started using this dam. It's this little thing that goes over the shower drain. And it makes sure that if, if you're a dummy like me and you forget and you leave the water running, it's never going to go higher than about two inches in the shower. And it'll start overflowing into the dam. So we did that for many years. Everybody in my company did it. And we caused a lot of leaks, a lot of failed 
child showers where it's leaking right through the pan. And, you know, that's, I'd want to know about that if I'm buying a house, but as it turns out, a lot of people don't like that. And we ended up causing so many leaks. We would have whole real estate offices ban us from doing any of their listings. It would be in the listing notes. Structure tech isn't allowed. And it got to a point where it was serious. Like, we're not allowed anywhere. And we we eventually kind of had to change our policy because it's either, look, I, I stand my ground. I say, this is, this is important and we need to do this. And I don't have any business. Or we just say, look, this is totally exceeding the standard of practice. People are getting mad at us ruining our houses. And we eventually had to change our policy. And we do not flood test towel shower pans anymore. Yeah, I, I agree. It's um, you know, I run hot water in the t in the shower pretty much the whole time I'm inspecting the bathroom because you're more likely to get a leak with hot water because things expand. Uh, but I can tell you, here's my advice: never, ever, ever leave a room when there's a plumbing fixture running. Ever, ever. <laughs> yeah, and and um, I I mean I, I like Mike's Mike's thoughts on on the hot water causing more leaks we run cold water partially because we'll run water for, I mean, my company policy is at least 20 minutes, maybe 30, maybe 40 minutes in that tiled shower. We let it go for a long time and we scan the ceilings below those tiled showers with an infrared camera to see if there's any leaks. And we do cause a lot of leaks doing that. And nobody complains about that because we're not doing a flood test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you let run the hot water for any length of time, you're going to steam up everything. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, drain the water meter. <laughs> yeah. So our, ne our next question is: What's the difference between solid foam core PVC? Oh, excuse me, between solid and foam core PVC, besides being black lettered and red lettered. I don't know. Is there? Is I, I think I've seen black and red lettered foam core. Yeah, um, there's but no maybe difference. not. Yeah, okay. But uh, basically, foam core, yeah, foam core is is um, just it's it's made to be it's less expensive to make it, and it should be cheaper. You know, if it's if it's solid PVC or foam core PVC, it's going to be approved for DWV. Although foam core is not approved to use with like a Cat four um, uh, 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 vent okay. connector and flue pipe for a furnace. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's the difference. That's the important thing we need to know about as home inspectors. Look, look for foam core on venting. Mm -hmm. yep. No foam core on a like a high efficiency water heater flue pipe is what you're saying. That's right. Category right. four or furnace, anything that's cat four, you know, high efficiency. And that black and red was was actually um, misleading because. That, Mark, wasn't it you that did the research? Yeah, I, I, I actually called Charlotte, uh, which is one of the big providers, mm -hmm. uh, at least on the East Coast. And he's like, oh, yeah, I get this question all the time. He's like, it's just a, to manufacturers. We we use red. <laughs> you know, some people yeah. use black. and it, you know, it's, right. but it doesn't designate anything. Um, mm -hmm. it, it might within some manufacturers, but it's not uh, an industry standard. So the difference is the dye they use in the lettering. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> How long are these newish plastic supply pipes going to last? PEX, CPVC? 32 sure. years. <laughs> I agree. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> Is that poly? That's poly. Beautifully no, that's right? PEX, I think. That's yeah. PEX. Yeah. Just, yeah. It's got the, the modern clinical. Oh, pipe. I got you. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, PEX yeah, has the... been in use, constant duty use for almost 60 years in Germany. Um, so it, it's been around a while. It's just growing in popularity here. Yeah, it's the bronze fittings that that uh, de-zincify that's the problem. Can you connect ABS to PVC? I will quickly say that as I was searching online, Ruben's face came up with like a whole YouTube video on, and he's like <laughs> cut them in half and showed all these different connections. So yes, you can. <laughs> but there's yeah. a specific way to do it. Yeah, it's not. I mean, th there's a product that's out there and it says ABS to PVC cement and it is UPC approved. 
to connect ABS to PVC, to a PVC system, drainage system. And we're talking about like at the house, it's not approved for using throughout the inside of the house. However, I mean, I've tested the heck out of these things, try to rip them apart. You use that cement, that green goop, you mm -hmm. ain't never getting it apart. It works really well. So from a home inspection perspective, you see that green cement. I, I mean, I shrug, I go, Hey, this technically isn't right. And it's never going to make any difference. So technically it's wrong. Never going to matter. I wouldn't call plumber out to fix it. We have a section coming up where, what do you do with the things that nobody's going to fix? How do you explain that? How do you call them out? We'll get to that in report Ooh. writing. Oh, and, and by the way, just real quick, we, we should give the correct answer. I'm sorry, we didn't even cover it. The proper way to connect those two materials is with what, what we call a mission coupling or a metal Mechanical. banded rubber coupling. It's going to have full support around it. That's the proper way to do it. It would be called a mechanical connection rather than a solvent based connection. Mm -hmm. Where is the best place to draw a well water sample? Depends on what you at the well? I've always heard the at, kitchen at, sink. After the filtration system, right? I mean, yeah. I've always heard that they want to do it at the kitchen sink, but uh, I don't do those samples. But it, it depends on what you're testing for. Mm -hmm. If you're testing for, if you want to know if it's coming out of the well, then you want to test as close to the well as you can. If mm -hmm. you want to know if it's coming out of the lead pipes, you want to make sure it runs through copper pipes. If you're wanting to test mm -hmm. for, um, you know, if you want to test for, and, and and some, it also depends on whether it's the first time you turn the water on or the second time you turn the water on. You know what I mean? You want to get a, a if it's something that's sitting in the pipes for a while. Um, and then, so each time, each one has its own protocol and you got to follow that protocol. Yeah, whatever the lab says. Yeah, exactly. So the answer is it depends. Well, yep. can, How do you report copper pipe issues? Oh, I'm oh. sorry. Yeah, actually, we just went through this uh, two days ago. But what we have found is is really a bad place to take a um, sample these days is the kitchen sink. And part of it is the fact that so many of them have that sprayer built into the faucet, and water just sits in that loop forever. And we had a negative or a positive test come come, and the sellers questioned it. And we talked with the lab, and they asked where we took it, and did it have that particular setup? And it, it did. And we went back and tested it again. And it came back clean when we took it from the hose bib. And that's where the lab said the safest place, the easiest place to sanitize without plastic or anything that you have to worry about harming is the hose bib. And so that's what he said. Take it from the hose bib. We have another comment here. Maryland Department of Environment says for drinking water to take it from the bathroom sink or tub for cooking reasons they want you to take it from the kitchen sink to test for lead um so there's been a lot of comments in this seminar today that do not reflect maryland regulations for home inspections and water testing just now so i think that should be considered that we're maryland that we got to follow maryland standards for inspections whether it be home inspections or water that's a good point. And actually, one thing we meant to start off with, and we'll reinforce this maybe after lunch, is that uh, all of this discussion is uh, our opinions, you know, what, what we might do. Uh, we are not sitting up here saying, this is how you should do it. Uh, definitely trying to provide a, this is what we do. You can take it or leave it. Yeah, generates good conversation. How do you report you. copper pipe issues? Electrolysis, when you have uh, different materials, steel and galvanized, life expectancy of copper, sensitivity to acid, history of pinhole <laughs> leaks. Here in, here in Montgomery County, WSSC didn't want to uh, take ownership of this, but they tweaked the water and all of a sudden we had pinhole leaks all over the place in the late 90s and early 2000s. And then they tweaked the water again and they kind of stopped. Was it acidic? I, mean, I don't know what the issue was. It, it, yeah. It's also thin-walled. 
the, the way I recall that story, it was it was when they they were cleaning up the water, they removed some of the organic compounds from the water, which left the heavy metals that would adhere to the lining of the the, in, the interior surface of the of the copper. Is that way you remember that, Jim? Uh, and they couldn't figure it out. I mean, it was there was newspaper stories all over the place about it, yeah. and uh, I think it was somebody from VPI who finally figured it out. I mean, they um, WSSC came to a Macashi meeting back in those days and brought a pipe that had, had a section of a three quarter inch pipe that they had cut from end to end. So if you looked at the outside, you saw a leak in the middle of a green dot, and there were other green dots. And if you turn the pipe over so that you could see the inside, there are these little pieces of metal adhered to the inside of that pipe where corresponding with the green dot on the, on the outside. So whenever I see a green dot on a copper pipe, mm -hmm. that's what I remember. That's, they, they, they're, they're, they're moving in the direction of someday having a pinhole leak. Hmm. And yeah, now I, it's a picture. I, yeah, I just report exactly what I see. You know, that green uh, material on the pipe, that's you know, copper oxidation, and that's not a good sign. And, you know, I would recommend a plumber check the entire system. You know, basically copper piping, it depends. There's many different grades. There's M and there's L. Uh, there used to be a grade called D, which was distribution grade that was awful. And I think it's probably all gone. Um, and then there's K, which is real heavy. And I've only seen that in a service pipe from the street to the house. But you know, I just report what I see. And I think if, if you're getting, you know, 30 to 50 years out of a copper supply system, that's pretty darn good. If the discoloration or corrosion is black, it can be hydrogen sulfide. And we had a problem in Florida where they had uh, Chinese drywall that was outgassing and destroying copper pipes like you wouldn't believe, eating up evaporator coils. Yeah, you just, you know, I just report what I see and recommend a plumber. There's so many different variables. Yeah. And I recommend that the entire system be checked, not just that one location. Because once you see one, there's probably going to be more. And I often I see right at a joint, uh, even on a newer repair, and I, I'm assuming, but I will note it, but likely it's a sign that the plumber didn't wipe off the flux that had, had come out right. and just left it. It was a little bit sloppy. Right. Uh, but, you know, that's... Yeah, that happen. happens. But that right. the picture you showed before was not that. No, no, that was definitely no, no, that's not. Right. Do dielectric fittings work? To protect steel pipes. I think when they're properly installed, yes. That, yes. That's their job. Right. That's, that's what they do. Yeah, dielectric union, or we used to just use a, about a six inch long brass nipple, did the same thing and and um, was better and it didn't interrupt continuity of the bond of the metal piping. Uh, we all know that it's hot on the left and cold on the right, but what about front and rear? Many of your kitchen faucets, uh, the temperature is going to go front to back. Which way is hot? Which way is cold? Whatever the manufacturer says. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think home inspectors like to really overthink this one and be like, oh, if there's a kid there and they grab it, blah, 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 yeah. it's hot. It's like you're really overthinking it. Don't right. make if a that big kid, deal out of it. Yeah, I, if that kid's tall enough. Anything. Yeah, if that kid's yeah. big enough to reach the faucet in the kitchen, he should know better. <laughs> yeah. Now, in right. my personal opinion, if you were to turn it and one direction is left, that ought to be hot and mm -hmm. the other's right. That ought to be cold. That's what makes sense to me. But that's just my opinion. That... <laughs> yeah, the, the only thing I run into sometimes is, you know, if you're in a, a kitchen or a house that has multiple fixtures that are the same one, they should all be the same way. So... You've got two sinks in the kitchen, same faucet fixture. Hot should be the same direction. Cold should be the same direction. They shouldn't be different. How important are pressure balanced shower valves? Well, if you're in one and somebody is running the cold water right next to you, it's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have never said a thing about that in a home inspection. I don't test it. I don't say anything about it. Yeah, we're required to have them, but you can't really tell, you know, unless you're you're changing, you're running something else, and then you go check the temperature of the shower. It's kind of difficult. 
So we're, yeah. we're not required to report that stuff. I think it was a lot bigger deal when there was more galvanized pipes. When they, when they, when they got, when there was a rust buildup inside the galvanized pipes, I think that's when that was a more important. How important is backflow prevention, cross connections, hose bibs, bathtubs, dishwasher high loop? Is this a real deal? Is this important? We, uh, for my company, we check all these things. I mean, we're looking mm -hmm. at. The, the fill valves on toilets. We're looking for vacuum breakers on outside faucets. We're, we're, we're looking for it everywhere. We wanna make sure that there's no potential for the potable water to come in contact with contaminated water. That's the whole reason we have a plumbing code. I mean, that's, that's at the very beginning of the plumbing code is make sure that we have clean potable water. And anytime you've got a cross connection, something that's wrong there, we, we write it up and we're not saying like, hey, it's a safety hazard, somebody's gonna die, but all it takes is one event to contaminate a municipal supply and it is hideously expensive for a county to clean up their city water. There's a good example. What is the purpose of the trap? Um, I could I could read a little code section that I have here because it's right in the code. It's super simple. Mm -hmm. uh, the plumbing system should be provided with a system of vent piping that allow the ad admission or emission of air so that the liquid seal of any fixture trap shall not be, you know, I don't even like the way it's phrased. Let's make it really simple. Uh, a trap prevents sewer gas from coming into the house. That's it's it. It's a water seal. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and depending where you live, it also helps keep vermin out yeah and then and then when it comes to the vent the whole purpose of a vent is to protect the trap that's it um i don't home inspectors i i when i was getting into home inspections i was taught you know you take a water bottle and you dump it upside down and and water is going to go out of there really slowly but then if you had a hole here it's going to drain really fast and that's why we need plumbing vents just to help things drain properly and that's complete nonsense that has nothing to do with the standard plumbing system. The only reason we have traps, I mean, the only reason we have vents is to protect our traps. Once you put a vent on a drain system, it's actually going to drain slower. Dramatic pause there. Cause <laughs> I've always, I've always taught people the opposite up until I started thinking more about this and doing my own testing. And I've, I've done every type of test you can imagine on this over and over again. And as soon as you add a vent, the drain is actually gonna go slower. And the purpose of a vent is to prevent all that water on the trap from getting sucked out. Mm -hmm. And also if you got back pressure, it prevents, it prevents air from blowing that trap seal out. That's the only reason we have a vent. And any other story you talk about with a water bottle upside down and things draining better, it's not true. It's home inspector and plumber folklore. I guess the only thing I would say about that is I've 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 had experiences where fixtures have problems draining because of the vent and the vent being blocked. <laughs> well, then it's like not having a vent. And then we had drainage problems. Mm. I, I will challenge anybody to take a fixture, cut the vent, cap it off at your own house, do something and do a side-by-side -side test and see which drains, which drains faster. Yeah, how many have seen uh, inspected a house and all the test caps are still in, installed in all the vents at the on the roof? <laughs> I I just had that the other day, and mm -hmm. we were draining a bunch of fixtures, and we sucked all the water out of the one of the traps at the sink, and it was gurgling like crazy, and you could hear it all. But, yeah, the gurgling is a good signal that something is wrong. Yeah, right. What's wrong with double trapping? Oh, traps in series? Yeah. Well, the water gets moving a little fast and it can suck one of the traps or both traps dry. Also, it, it could create a clogging issue. That's what pretty much I think. Uh, Ruben, you got anything else on that? Yeah, it's I I, I think it's... <laughs> Sorry, Mike. I, I think it's because the water goes too slow. It's got to go through one Maybe. trap and then it's got to go through a second trap and it doesn't have the right velocity to self-scour the trap. Traps stay pretty clean 
by that self scouring action of the water going through there. And the trap is going to slow that water down. And when it gets slowed down twice, it doesn't go through that second trap fast enough to keep itself scouring. Yeah, could be. I, I'd have to set up, do a setup with like clear piping. I'd like to do that experiment someday. And see we should do it together. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have fun. Uh, where are air admittance valves allowed? How long have they been allowed there? With AAVs everywhere, do we still need a vent through the roof? Mike, I can't talk about the history. Okay. Um, well, AAVs, which is not a mechanical vent. It's not, I will just establish the difference first. An AAV does not have a spring and a neoprene you know, gasket in, like you see in manufactured homes, what sometimes people call a cheater vent. An AAV is, is different. It uses negative pressure to, to raise up a disc, a Teflon disc. But anyway, they've been, they're, they're allowed pretty much everywhere, depending upon what plumbing code your jurisdiction used. Because yeah, the UPC, yeah. they're not allowed in UPC, IRC, they're allowed. So, um, and they've been around for, uh, gosh, maybe 20, 30 years. But if you're doing a whole house system with AAVs, there still is a requirement that you have at least one pipe go outside. And now it can be sidewall or through the roof, but that's going to be in case you get a positive pressure in the system, you got to have a place for that to release. So one vent has to go through the roof. So we are uh, wrapping up right now. I got and... one question from the field oh, here. Go ahead, Larry. Um, uh, uh, can you distinguish the difference between regular bonding of the gas piping for electrical code purpose? In other words, return path for 120 volt shorts from lightning protection bonding for CSST, which is more intense. Can we discern the difference? Can you distinguish the difference? Well, yeah, if you can see it. I mean, yellow should be bonded with at least a number six copper. That's pretty big wire. Okay. Um, the black you can bond as you would bond any type of hard pipe, and it can be bonded just by simple connection to an appliance that has an equipment ground. So there's many different, you know, if it's for the yellow, it's significantly different. So you, uh, this is the question I'm bringing up. So you want to be, you want to be looking for the number six wire. Well, yeah, for yellow, yes. Yeah, which you're yellow. pretty rarely going to find. 